Welcome back to the morning show here on the Raj News. I am Ade Sua. And I'm Rafa Yosini. Well, the EU election observation mission report on the 2019 general elections in Nigeria has continued to generate reactions. Although some positives were highlighted by the report, it largely slammed the elections as lacking transparency and marred by violence, as well as harassment of voters, amongst others. But it did not only make observations, it also preferred recommendations. In a tweet, it said, EU election observ observation mission's final report on general elections in Nigeria, 30 recommendations to improve future elections. Systemic failings seen in, seen in the election and the relatively low levels of voter participation show the need for fundamental electoral reform, end quote. Well, political strategist Ademola Olariwaju joins us now to discuss his interpretation of the report. Welcome to The Morning Show. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. What did you make of this report? Uh, what is the one message this report sends to Nigeria? Oh, well, I think it is, um, it is a confirmation of what we've always known, that the February 23 elections were a reversal of the successes of the various past electoral successes that Nigeria had had, uh, the 2019 election, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it didn't meet up, meet up with standard. And, you know, shortly after the EU report came out, you know, you had the IRI report and the, uh, and the okay. NDIA report, you know, also come out. And it said much the same thing, that this election simply did not meet up to democratic standards for various reasons, you know, the, 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 the violence, the, um, um, all sorts of, um, um, irregularities by the, the the electoral umpire, and then you know you had you had they mentioned you know the use of the power of incumbency across board you know many state governments and you know from the federal government. So I think yes, it is a confirmation of what we as Nigerians have always known. Um, personally, I'm not um, I'm not excited. I'm not overly excited because it is it is um, it is a Nigerian thing, and those of us who are in Nigeria should be able to push our battles. But for those who, who do not um, believe that some Nigerians can be impartial, um, it is understandable that they would wait for the European Union to confirm it. And when you have the, the, the confirmation such as this from international bodies, then it becomes okay. Maybe they have, they have a point to make. I must add that um, Mr. President had an opportunity to make this election a different one, you know, to, 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 to make it one for the, for the record books as the 2015 elections were. But he did not take that opportunity. The Electoral uh, Act was amended. He should have signed that into law before the election, but he chose not to, he chose not to sign it. And, you know, the result is what we have uh, today, which is, which, is, which is, you know, the flood elections we had. Like we know, th this report's a very nuanced because it depends on your perspective, that's how you take it. A lot of people will say on your part, Demola, you're just, it's just sour grapes, what you're saying. They will say they beat you fair and square in an election. It took you to the cleanest, despite whatever message you had in the PDP, and they did a double whammy on you guys. So deal with it. Mm, for those who don't understand, <laughs> is a member of the PDP. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Mm. So they did a double whammy on you guys. Just deal with it. Face your election petition. Once you're done with that, face your Supreme Court and let sleeping dogs lie. I'm sure that's what the APC will say to you this morning. In 2015, the PDP lost elections at the presidential level. We lost across so many states. The PDP did not go to court at all. PDP withdrew from the stage and handed over power peacefully. After 16 years, we handed over to the President Muhammad Buhari, Buhari government. Remember that there had been predictions that this nation was going to go into crisis following 2015 election, but that did not happen because of the temperament of PDP. Look, you cannot be in politics in any form, either as a strategist or, you know, as anything, as a politician yourself, without having the grace to lose. When you lose, you should be able to concede. But it is one thing to lose fair and square. It is another thing to lose by manipulations of the system. And that is, that, for me, that is why we have refused to move on. And for me as a person, for me as a young person in Nigeria and as a young person in politics, I feel that it is most important that this electoral fraud of February 23 should be challenged in the court of law. Because you see, the result of this last election actually followed a, what I believe is a nepotistic trend. Um, the entire three zones of the north produced 17 million, 17 million votes combined. The entire three zones of the south produced 9 million votes combined. Since Nigeria has been holding elections since 1992, since the Clifford Constitution of 1992, where the elective principle was introduced, there has never been a time where that margin existed as much. 
all the time Nigeria was northern, northern Nigeria and southern Nigeria, that margin has never been that much. But they brought it this time around by various manipulations, which, you know, is going to be proven on court. And I think, you know, it is important for us to set the record straight as far as those figures are concerned. So it is not about um, sour grapes. I mean, this party has lost elections before. We can always lose elections again. It's not a big deal. But if you lose free and square on the battlefield, if we were not voted for, then, you know, it would be a different Somebody thing. Somebody will say to you that the incumbent has always had that block vote of 10 million, which he has shown on three different occasions. Consistently. Consistently. Mm. So what's the difference there? And you're talking Clifford's constitution of 1922 to where we are now. What's the difference in a man that has always, even some people would tell you that this, the incumbent president, President Muhammad Buhari, can take any political party and get that 10 million block vote. He did it with AMPP, he did it with CPC, he did it with ACE, uh, or other political parties. And with just what he has with the APC, he's been able to get a leeway. So what are you talking about? First of all, this entire meet of 10 million votes, there's no 10 million votes for Buhari anywhere. You know, what is an scored? invention. What it's is an scored? invention of the APC. Election. 2011, he scored about 10 million. 20, 2011 was actually the first time he would cross that barrier. I think about 12 million in 2011. Against President Olusha Gombasanjo, he also did about 10. But against a fellow and northerner, against, against, against a fellow Jonathan. northerner in 2007, Gulag Jonathan was 2011. Against a fellow northerner, no, 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 yeah, in 2000, in 2007, was he did not do that. 2011 and 2015 was yeah. Gulag good good was uh, good 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 Jonathan. Yeah. Now. What I find interesting, since we are talking numbers, is that the margin of people who have PVCs increased in the 2015 election, but President Mwari, Mwari Dubari's margin decreased down to about 15.4 million this time around. You see, if you look at the trend of the election in this particular, in this, at this particular period, you will see that the PDP made advances in various states that were considered impregnable by the opposition, by the ruling party initially, Bauchi, Zamfara, Katsina, and so many other places across the north were able to retain Sokoto, were able to regain Adamawa. These are places that were considered strongholds of the president. If you look at the margin, even in his own state, Katsina, if you look at the gubernatorial margin, if you look at the senatorial margins, it is far different from what we have in the presidential, uh, uh, presidential margin, you know, which we believe that the figures were manipulated, and that's why INEC, you know, does not want anybody to inspect the servers. But you see, Beyond that, I, and I think what happened is simple. President Muhammad Ubari was demystified, you know. After he was voted into office, the last four years have been nothing to write home about, and everybody knows it. And even the, 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 the you know, the, um, the, the masses of the North, who you could call his uh, solid breeze before, they saw that, look, this man whom we thought was a messiah has not made our lives better. You know, so, and, and that was why, you know, the election trend went that way. But they would always sell this perception to the public that, oh, there are 10 million votes in somebody's pocket, there are another 5 million votes in somebody's pocket to cover the rigging that occurred on February 23. And that's what you have here. Yeah. We'll, we'll, leave, we'll, leave, we'll leave the, the numbers and, the, uh, and, and approving of that to the tribunal. But let's talk about what some other things that this report has talk, uh, mentioned. Um, talked about Nigerian politicians lacking lack ideology. It says before, during the campaigns, mm. they were jumping shifts. Well, I think, I think you and know... that was not an APC matter. It was Nigerian politicians, including your party. It was also indicted, your party was also indicted when it comes to violence. They said the leading parties in the country failed to rein in their supporters to stop those acts of violence. Well, the truth, the, when you say fail to rein in, you see, the responsibility of um, curbing violence, especially on ele election day, um, lies mainly with the federal government. The federal government, not even the state governors, the federal government controls all the forces, all the, um, they, 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 they control the, 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 um, the ability to use force, you know, all the forces in the country, the legal forces, you know, the military, the DSS, and so on and so forth. PDP is not in power. We're not able to deploy. As well, a matter of fact, you had, as a matter of fact, you had sitting governors who were, who were, you know, you had the SA to the, the SA to the River State Governor Marshal Obuzo. Marshal Obuzo was uh, was arrested. The Commissioner for Education uh, Tamuno uh, Tamuno Gowa Jack, he was also arrested. So you had all these things. So. If they say the leading parties, then, you know, it is, of course, I would understand that, that, you know, they wanted to balance it. But we as Nigerians know that there is no, no state governor in this, especially on election day. As a matter of fact, they will tell you that, look, DSS cannot even accompany you as a governor to the polling unit, that no policeman can accompany you as a governor to the polling unit. The violence that was visited, we saw where those violence happened. 
I mean, in Lagos here, we are all witnesses to, you know, areas like Okota, areas like Suriri, my own constituency, Suriri, and so many other places, thugs were unleashed. So if anybody says that, you know, PDP was also involved in acts of thuggery, I would like to know, because from all reports that I have, you know, nothing of the sort happened. But you cannot, but if it had happened, PDP is not a party that endorses violence in any way. If it had happened, it would have then been up to the security agents to arrest such a person, whether he's a PDP member or he's an EPC member, so long as he's engaged in violence. But then, once our people see a trend that you are letting the APC, people, APC fellows, you know, run riot all over the place without arresting them, but as soon as PDP people try to defend themselves or to react, then, you know, you start to arrest the PDP people, you know, there would be some inconsistency in that. So I quite understand the European Union's position on that, but we as Nigerians know that what we are running here is not exactly a federalism. Um, we call ourselves a federal country, but, you know, there is no uh, restructuring, there is no devolution of powers. The presidency, the federal government, control the entire forces of security in this country, and any um, issue of violence should be put at the doorsteps of the ruling party, which is in control of the government. Would you say anything have changed? Because again, to my first question about ideology and Nigerian politicians lacking it. Um, they also mentioned lack of loyalty to party. That was void because they did not see that if you're able to jump shifts uh, during campaigns, then you probably don't stand for anything. What has changed? Would you say anything has changed really on the part of the Nigerian politician to offer service to the Nigerian people? Well, you know, what I would say is that um, people have different motives for coming into politics. Um, and so I cannot sit here and fault anyone for moving from party to party. You know, you have aspirations, you have reasons for coming. And if you want to move, you, you move. But um, for me, I believe that my generation of politicians or my generation of, of people, young people in politics, that we must be able to hold up ideals, we must be able to hold up ideology, we must be able to to preach, to have a central message that we preach that binds us to a political party, you know, so whatever it is that you embrace. But then again, if you look at it from the political party side, you would see that, you know, there's only one major party in this country that has an ideology, and that's the PDP, you know, which has the nationalism as its ideology. If you're Igbo, if you're Hausa, if you're Yoruba, if you're Calabar, if you're from anywhere, any part of the country, you can come into the PDP and you, you rally around that nationalism. But the PDP zones too. Yes, oh, oh, PDP zones. PDP believes and, very much in zoning because and, PDP and, understands and is zoning that. Zoning a reflection of nationality? Well, it is because PDP wants everybody to be involved. And very interestingly, Rufai, when the APC was in opposition at that time, APC condemned the zoning principles of PDP and said that, you know, why is PDP zoning? But they got into power and they discovered that it is impossible for you to govern Nigeria without balancing and carrying everybody along, which is what the PDP has always preached. Um, you know, I was saying that you, know, you have to have parties that have ideology and not just you know, putting those ideologies in your mm. party acronym you know, and call yourself progressive without Lara, being Lara, progressive. Mr. we'll come back to discuss some more on this EU, EU report and politics in Nigeria after this break. Please stay with us. Thank you for staying with us on The Morning Show here on Naraj News. We still have with us political strategist uh, Olari Waju, and he's a member of the People's Democratic Party as well. We're talking about the EU report and politics in Nigeria. Um, we talked about ideology, Nigerian politicians lacking ideology. But there are also other issues raised, like the low turnout, 34.1% for the presidential elections. At the state level, even lower, but the figures are not available. Why do you think that Nigerians were so disinterested in these elections? And don't go saying it's the APC issue because no. your party was also in these elections. What I would say, what I would say is this: until the conclusion of the um, tribunal case and the declaration of the Supreme Court, I cannot accept those figures by INEC. I was in Abuja for that election. You know, I was in Abuja for the presidential, and then I came to Lagos for the gubernatorial. In Abuja, from all reports, Nigerians trooped out to vote in that election in large numbers. But this was even and the then EU when INEC came this out... Was, this was the EU figure, 34.1%. Yes, no, 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 the EU, 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 EU took figures, you know, the officially, the manually accredited, um, the officially declared mm -hmm. by INEC. That's what they are quoting, that's 34.1%. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at it, it is statistically inconsistent, and I will prove this to you. In the three months before the election, across the entire zones of the South, you had an average of 30% PVC pickup by the figures of INEC about 30% PVC pickup in the three months before the election. Mm. People were turning out to pick up their, election, their, their, their PVCs. Mm. It was increased by 30%. And suddenly on election day, you had 24% voter turnout for the for, for, for South-South. You had 27% for the Southeast, and then you had about 28%. 
It is inconsistent because if people had bothered to pick up their PVCs across the, uh, uh, the southern zones, if, they had, if there had been an increase in the three months preceding election of people picking up their PVCs, that means they intended to vote. And then, you know, you now show a downward trend. Whereas if you go to the northern zones, you will discover that the, 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 the PVC collection rate prior to the election was about 27%, and then on, on election day, the margin went up, which is inverse. So these things are statistically incorrect, and those are part of the things that the PDP is going to prove in, at the uh, election tribunal, that, you know, these figures are inconsistent. So I do not believe that there was a low turnout, because we were all, we are all Nigerians, we were there, we saw people in the field, and when the figures started coming in, in fact, can I just say this? Surprisingly, guess which two states in Nigeria have almost the highest voter turnout? Borno and Yobe. Borno, where there was a, a Boko Haram attack the day before the election. And the following, there, was a, there was an election attack in the morning of that day, I think close to Maiduguri, at the um, polling unit. They had to combine all the polling units and put it at the government technical college. People did not come out to vote, but when they were going to declare results from, that, from those particular polling units, they awarded APC about 11,494 votes. They awarded PDP 494 oh, votes. Okay. So, let, let, so let, it, is, it, is, it, is, let, it is funny let's to me. all this, uh, you know, numbers are very general because we can't defend most of them, and we, we need uh, okay. an air to balance it. I just want to ask you this. Is picking up your PVC tantamount to you going out to vote? For the fact that you picked up a PVC, does it mean you must vote? Exactly. And will you use that as a yastic to say, oh, because people picked up their PVC, that they voted? I mean, there are many factors. Like, take, for instance, voter apathy we saw in Lagos. After the uh, violence in some areas of Lagos, people didn't come out to vote afterwards, all right? In a place like uh, Rivers, Abonema, nobody would tell you, that, oh, the case was certain, it was good in Abonema, for instance. And I'm sure those people, too, that were leaving their villages in droves days to that election after the military man was killed, had their PVCs, too. So well, is that a factor? Well, statistically, if you have an increase in PVC collection rates, if you have about 30 percent, it is almost statistically impossible, you know, for those figures to be reversed when it comes to voting. But I agree with you, and I concede that point, that it is possible that various other factors also affected voter turnout. But guess which results are more consistent with the PVC collection rate? It is the, 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 you know, the server results that, we are, that, that the PDP is, is, is presenting at the, at the presidential election petition tribunal. So for me, it's not just about the numbers. 34.1 percent, I mean, that's even lower than 2015. And we all, I mean, we are all Nigerians. We were all there. We saw these things. We saw people coming out in massive numbers. And then when INEC comes out and tells us that, oh, only 34.1% comes out, I think those numbers need to be queried. So personally, I'm not, um, I mean, and if you, if you look at this trend all across the media and even across political analysts and strategists all over the country, nobody is really, you know, using those figures as a yardstick for, um, for actual electoral analysis because those numbers look too off. Those numbers look too off. If you are telling me that, you know, the, the Borno state, has a higher voting margin than a state like Lagos State. I, I, I find that hard to believe because these things, these are things that have never happened since 1922, since Nigeria's won election. Why must 2019 be the outlier? You know, if you look at these figures, and you know, we don't want to get into figures, but if you look at those figures, you discover that the 2019 figures are so, are so funny that it could only have been manipulated. And when you look at them even more closely, you will discover that some of them were manipulated quite, you know, um, in, in, a, in a, the numbers don't come up randomly. You know, so I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, you know, but it will be proven at the, at the uh, election tribunal. We also saw misuse of state resources in um, this report, misuse of state resources and vote, vote buying, which remains generally, um, you know, unaddressed, undermining voters' choices at the elections. But even beyond the elections, uh, the National Assembly elections recently, uh, there were allegations of uh, vote buying, so to say, is the Nigerian politician so devoid of ideas mm. and, you know, principles that we have to, after elections after elections, we have vote ban? And now even at the National Assembly uh, level. Well, at this point, you, you... As a political strategist, what goes on in the mind of a Nigerian politician on election, for elections? To be fair, I wouldn't put this squarely on the Nigerian politician. I would say that it's the Nigerian society, as it were. Mm. Um, poverty has been weaponized. You know, our people have become so poor. Um, on one hand, there's the economic factor, you know, of poverty becoming weaponized. So because you are so poor, you just want to accept anything. 
And then on the other hand, on the political side, is that there is this disconnect between voters and the people that they vote for. And so they can't see any correlation between their votes and their lives becoming better. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is, look, I don't know when I'm going to see this politician again. So if he's paying me 2,000 naira for a vote, I better take this 2,000 naira and be done with it. And I'll just give him my vote. So, so there's that problem, you know, with the, with, the, with the electorate. And that is why we keep on saying that, you know, more people who, who are, you know, who can resist those temptations. I mean, nobody's going to come and buy your vote for 2,000 naira. But then the problem is that um, why would I want to buy your vote for an exorbitant price if I can easily get the vote of somebody else who just has a thumbprint, you know, whatever it is, if, even if he's not, um, even if he's mentally imbalanced, but I can get his vote for 1,000 naira, so your vote is equal to his. So that's, that's the problem on one side. On the side of the politicians, I would say that, you know, many politicians in Nigeria are just lazy. They don't want to campaign. They don't want to do the hard work of campaigns, and so they just want to engage in vote buying. I'm happy that the EU report pointed it out because it is actually one of the points mm -hmm. of the article petition uh, at the court that, you know, Trader money, which was being shared, was a, was a vote-buying scheme by, uh, by, by the ruling party because, one, it was not budgeted for. It was not anywhere in the 2019 budget. They just sourced this money from somewhere and started giving to people. Two, the vice president has debunked that. It was in the budget. No. Professor Yemi yeah. Oshibashu, yes. Oshibashu was asked that question at the town hall meeting, and he responded, it wasn't Well, I'm, I'm, I'm personally happy to hear that, because we'll look forward, we'll, look, we'll look forward, we'll look forward, we'll and, forward to putting that. And, and they said, what was in the budget? What was in the budget? Mm -hmm. Well, special intervention projects. That was SIPs, mm -hmm. you know, social, social intervention. But, but, social but, intervention. But, but, but they said those monies were part of the grand SIP scheme, trader money, Farmer money, and, uh, and, and, and it suddenly came up in the final year of the government. They it said suddenly that, that came was up, when the release started. Came up, it suddenly came up in states where gubernatorial elections were holding. For instance, when gubernatorial elections were to be held in Ikiti, they took trader money to Ikiti. When it was to be held in Osho, no, but, they but took it, it to Osho as well. But, but, uh, and I, I, Transparency I, I, International, Transparency yeah. International, the chairman of Transparency International in Nigeria said clearly on record that this trader money scheme is the use of state resources. Which is why I like how the EU put it, because it is the same way that, um, that Transparency International captured it and said that it is the use of state resources to buy votes. So there is that correlation between it. And we want to know, bear in mind, that in 1999, Chief Olufalaya took um, the then president-elect, Urusha Gobasodjo, to court, and he alleged that there was vote buying. And the court said, look, yes, there was vote buying, but you cannot establish a connection between that people who bought votes and the government of uh, Ulushe Gumba Sonjo, and so they threw it out. In 2019, there is evidence that trader money was, there is a correlation between that and the government itself, you know, so that correlation is clear. It is now left for the tribunal or the courts to determine if that can be termed vote buying. Also, Chief Ulushe Gumba Sonjo came out and made the same statement. I mean, most people knew that this was what was going on on a certain level. But, you know, but all in all, it is condemnable that Nigerians have to, uh, we have to resort to vote buying. Again, we've had many elections in this country. Vote buying went on at some level, but it was not this rampant but as it became will say your last year. Vote vote. I cannot dispute that. Okay. To be, to be frank, I mean, I can be everywhere. I can only say that, you know, I've never bought votes and, and I don't know, I don't encourage people to buy votes. But I know that these things go on on both sides because, like I said, even the voters will come to you and tell you, if we vote for you, what are you going to give us? Oh, we'll do this when we get into office. They don't want to know. All they are concerned about, look, these guys are offering me 2,000 naira. I want to vote for you, but I mean, you've got to give me something. So if you're giving me 500 naira, I'm OK with it, but just give me something. And so I know that these things happen, but it has to be fought systemically. One, poverty has to be reduced so that the representation of poverty by, um, by the political office holders will stop. And then secondly, the political class just has to do better. And apart from that, way forward, I mean, 2023, we think it's far, but it's just right around the corner. The way forward is very simple. President Muhammadu Buhari needs to sign the Electoral Act. He needs to sign the Electoral Amendment Act. It should go back to the, it will go back to the Senate since he didn't sign it with the 18th. It should go back to the 9th Senate, and um, that will be, that will, and, you know, either he signs it or if um, his Excellency Atiku Abubakar is declared, he would sign it when he comes into that office. But we all agree on the need for electoral reforms. See, the journey that we are in Nigeria presently started as far back as 2007, when President Umaru Musa Yaradua had the courage and the humility to admit that the election that brought him in was flawed. And he set him, he put in place an electoral reform process headed by Justice Muhammadu Weiss. And that electoral reform process, even when he died, was carried on by President Gulag Jonathan. He chose an impartial umpire for 2011-2015. 
And we saw how elections started. More people were coming out to vote because people started to believe in their votes. And look, if we can vote out a sitting president, then, you know, there's nothing that we cannot achieve with our votes. But this time around, you know, you have a ruling party that just came into power and is exhibiting the behavior that PDP used to exhibit in the very early days, you know. You just well, read, you read your way through. PDP oh, I mean, I, I, look. And there's no difference. I'm first of all a Nigerian. I'm, I'm first of all a nationalist. I believe that, you know, whatever happens, happens to all of us. So mm. the interest of the country must be put first. So I would admit that, yes, PDP, in the early years, made some mistakes. But after a while, PDP got it right, and PDP put Nigeria on the part of democracy. So to do that, the president himself must commit fully to the democratic process. Thank you very much for coming on The Morning Show this Thank morning. Thank you, well. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate you. Thank you.